Welcome everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to have Professor Christian Miles as today's speaker in the seminar series of Statistical Mechanics organized by SMO Center. Uh, uh, professor Miles is a full professor at Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, in Leuven, Belgium. His main area of interest is non-equilibrium statistical physics and he's part that is the broad area of research and he is um, particularly interested in characterizing non-equilibrium steady states and fluctuations present in it. And uh, his research has made many important contributions in this area. Um, one import, among many, one such important contribution is the notion of frenesy, which they have introduced, which measures the extent of dynamical activity present in a non-equilibrium state. And um, he has also made, uh, he and his group has also made many important contributions in the topic of uh, active matter and non-equilibrium calorimetry. In fact, in the next week, he is going to present two lectures on non-equilibrium calorimetry, which will also be uh, done in this hybrid mode. So you are most welcome to join those lectures as well. Professor Mice, he finished his... Uh, PhD from Rutgers University in the year 1988 and he was mentored by Joel Lebowitz. He is actually who is considered one of the pioneers in the general field of non-equilibrium statistical physics. Then he spent some time as a research associate in Flemish Science Foundation in Belgium and since 2000 he is um, at Leuven till date. And he has served in, he has handled many editorial and institutional responsibilities. Over the years, he has served in uh, editorial boards of many uh, important journals, including Journal of Physics A, Mathematical and Theoretical, Journal of Statistical Physics, Journal of Mathematical Physics. He is also a member of steering committee of European Science Foundation program named Random Geometry of Large Interacting Systems and Statistical Physics. And um, it is not possible to list everything in this brief introduction, but there is one particular thing that I would like to mention. He has been closely involved in the organization of this school, Fundamental Problems in Statistical Physics, which happens in Leuven every four years. And many of us have actually attended this school and benefited from it from during our PhD or postdoc days. And today he will be talking about entropy of a tiger. So with this, I would like to invite Professor Myers to deliver the seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sakuntala. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Also, people who are abroad or maybe at home location. Um, indeed, the subject is the entropy of a tiger. But maybe I should start by saying that often it is a good habit, and history proves it, um, is the sound? Oh, maybe I should put it a bit higher. Thank you. So I was saying that it is often the case that we ask questions about the future unknown subject in terms of the concepts we have today. How else could we do that? So that's also why, if you are asking about non-equilibrium statistical physics or non-equilibrium thermodynamics, that means about systems which are driven, active tigerish, alive, that we often start by trying to see how equilibrium notions, energy, entropy, free energy, what it would mean in such a context. Now, soon, however, um, we are confronted with problems when we ask that question. And uh, a negative answer would then be, well, there is no such thing. We cannot speak about that. We should get away from this obsession with entropy. I mean, often in equilibrium statistical mechanics, people have an interest in entropy and entropy production. And perhaps we should uh, be more clear about what we really mean, what we, what we really are after. And that is uh, the subject of the talk, really. And that is to try to take that question in a positive way. And in particular, I would like to interpret this entropy as a thermal aspect, as a thermal problem as I will explain. So that is really the subject. In what sense will something related to a thermal entropy, I will now call it, 
that will be telling us about you know microscopic uh, degeneracies or uh, aspects that we usually associate with the system when we measure things like like heat all right so that is truly then we are entering in the notion of what we call this is an old subject calorimetry and the, the today's talk then of colloquium and the lectures of next week will be to try to attempt to learn from let's say heat aspects thermal properties something about indeed active driven systems driven active matter it is not so strange to do that i mean this is a long history of trying to use heat and thermal properties to learn something about the subject but that perhaps we have to get into a modern era where we also deal with metamaterials biophysics medical physics and what have you which really take us away from this traditional equilibrium passive matter as we had it before okay so more specifically i think um, we need to know what we mean by a heat capacity out of equilibrium and then we have to understand things like um, indeed is there something like a low temperature interesting anomaly that we also have in non-equilibrium systems is there for example an extension of the nernst postulate like an extension of the third law of thermodynamics and more generally what determines the heat capacity was is in it and one of the important lessons indeed is that more than an equilibrium we will get more information of different type of information which is not at all purely dissipative not purely traditionally heat or entropy related but has more to do with the dynamical activity and frenetic components all right so before we go on let me quickly remind you about equilibrium um, it's in fact that quite a miraculous thing this entropy miraculous in the sense that it is a protein concept which is a unique quantity okay you can make variations in the sense that you talk about free energy or other types of free energy but let's say entropy and the thermodynamic potentials they govern the equilibrium world they have the variation of principles so for example when we want to decide whether a particular matter comes in the form of a diamond or in the terms of graphite free energy decides more or less right? so it's it's extremely useful and it has many faces um, let me just remind you but that already would be a lecture or even a book in itself that the same entropy is truly playing so many different roles which i mean or you, you could not suspect so it was born around 1860-1865 in the works of Clausius directly related to the reversible heat over temperature which turns out to be an exact differential which gives rise to the definition of entropy but then I mean a shock to the world <coughs> so to speak came when the same entropy seemed to be related to fluctuations right so it was governing degeneracy it was telling us the probability of a particular fluctuation that was in the work of Boltzmann mostly but not only that it was also it was already present in the second part of Clausius heat theorem but more specifically also in the Boltzmann H theorem where entropy was functioning as an H functional to show monotonicity like a Lyapunov function which again is, is like an extremely uh, miraculous thing and if not that's not enough in the kind of fluctuation dissipation theorem it governs linear response it's really a dissipation theorem, fluctuation dissipation theorem. And more than that, it also gives rise to real forces, you know, like forces that you can feel in your muscles. That is like the Onsager thermodynamic forces that are entropic sometimes, entropic forces which govern like the, the theory of irreversible thermodynamics. So that's just a list of, of various and I think quite different um, aspects of physics realizations where the same entropy truly the same entropy is active and you can even have it in formulas if you wish and um, of course it's the same thing as what i said now but they are i'm just giving the formulas to tell you it's something precise it's not very vague it's, it's really very precise things that this unique entropy is acting on you and you can even commercialize it if you wish i have not seen that t-shirt but i think it's a good idea to have such a t-shirt at least on the fourth on the front you can put the five formulas of equilibrium statistical mechanics and maybe on the back we still have to invent some formulas 
for the non-equilibrium aspect of our lives. Um, so that's about the main thing, the general entropy, which is a unique thing which governs all of all of these things. All right. Um, if you go a little bit away from equilibrium, so by that I mean, you know, maybe I should say that for everybody that what I mean by going away from equilibrium, I mean by basically stay in a steady regime, stationary regime. So the macroscopic properties do not change in time, say. But nevertheless, currents are maintained. So I'm not speaking here for the moment about relaxation to equilibrium or transient regimes. I'm not even speaking about glasses. I'm really speaking about tigers, meaning you know there is a certain span of life and energy and length and all that where we can consider the system to be stationary and where currents of some type, time reversal breaking is present. There is a constant entropy production which is going on in these systems, dissipating to the environment. So that's what I mean by non-equilibrium. So for example, if we take an iron rod, for example, and we have yeah, an ice bucket on one side and we make it high temperature on the other side, there will be a stationary system a situation in that rod and there will be an energy current, right? Governed more or less by Fourier's law, depending on the two outside temperatures, the difference of that temperature. So that's a stationary situation. But now if we make the difference in temperatures very small, you could think about the linear regime. That's the so-called close to equilibrium regime. But Again, even though the books do not exist, it's possible to write a book about close to equilibrium today because we understand basically everything about the close to equilibrium regime. And um, there are various key words that perhaps are not always very familiar, I have found to, to people, but there is something like the Macaron Ensemble, which goes back from the 50s already. There are things like a rigorous understanding of a minimum and also a maximum entropy production principle in the linear regime, part of this theory of irreversible thermodynamics. And there's also a Clausius heat theorem. So it means that the notion of entropy as we got it inherited from the Clausius work actually is possible to be formulated in the linear regime around equilibrium. I will not explain exactly how, but there is something like that close to equilibrium. Now, um, tigers, however, you know perhaps more than me about tigers, but I have heard that they are truly non-equilibrium, and more than that, they are not even close to equilibrium. Actually, none of us is close to equilibrium, unfortunately. Um, but so we would like to understand what happens for these you know, aspects of entropy far from equilibrium. Um, now, I would like to um, emphasize that you know, compare it to a, a river. Um, I'm not sure whether the Ganga River is the good example here, so let it be in the valley where we have all the different streams and all the different rivers that come from the mountains. They all come in the same river, which is like the equilibrium valley. But if you go uphill, which means away from equilibrium, you will meet different types of rivers and they will have their own properties. So they will differentiate. So it's the same thing which you should take you have the t-shirt with all the formula, but if you go away from equilibrium, that splits up. It's no longer unique entropy, but all of these things you can ask separately. Well, also, it is true that in far from equilibrium, there is no such thing as an entropy doing everything. And I'm, of course, not the first to say this for the trivial thing, but I, in particular, I like this paper of 1975. I hope you can read it a little bit. It's uh, the title is Inadequacy of Entropy and Entropy Derivatives in Describing the Steady State. And by the steady state is meant the non-equilibrium steady state. So that's a short paper of like uh, three or four pages where Landauer explains why it can just not be true that you can <laughs> somehow differentiate between diamond and graphite by the energy function of if you are in non-equilibrium. There is no such thing as using the only concepts like entropy, energy, thermodynamic functionals to derive non-equilibrium, understand non-equilibrium. And in fact, in the conclusion of the paper is uh, something interesting. He is uh, recalling a conversation he had with Charlie Bennett, 
Um, and the example he's taking is that he says that to, right, to determine whether under a given set of planetary conditions, life is the preferred state, or is given planetary condition, he's asking, is life the preferred state? Um, or, or is it um, a meta, only a meta -based state? We cannot just compare the lifeless state and the non-biological state, but must consider the transitions between these states. So it goes on a little bit more, but the important word is transitions, and transitions, of course, dynamics, kinetics enters. So, I mean, in fact, if you, go, if you follow the, the paragraph that he's writing, he goes away from purely, like, say, um, static description in terms of state functions to notions which have many, much more to do with, you know, jumping around. I mean, you have to know something about the transition itself, which is a weaker way of saying, or the weakest way to say that is that the kinetics may come to, to, to matter, which could sound as very bad news, because if you have to know all the details of the dynamics, then what, what signs will you make on a mesoscopic and macroscopic level? Nevertheless, and that's part of the talk today, there will be some structure and there is some good news to be collected. Okay, um, so a tiger is a non equilibrium system. Um, I will not give you the diagram of its engine, but uh, clearly there is work being done. Uh, there is waste being deposited and all that. But um, let us wait with this diagram a little bit and let us maybe uh, remind ourselves of the a particular specific notion, and that's what we will be focusing on in these lectures or in this talk, rather, and that is the, the notion of heat capacity. Just to remind you, um, this is the formula and the textbooks that I copied from the internet somewhere, I guess, science heat. Um, so, so if we, we have heat, basically, which is a form of energy transferred, and um, it's proportional to the difference of temperature that you made between the two bodies. And this factor of proportionality, that's what we call the heat capacity. Like it's like an inertia. You give heat and you see how much the temperature is increasing. For example, for water, that would be 4,186 Julie per Kelvin, right? Or less, if I'm remembering correctly. But if you would do it for stone or so, or for sand, it would be much lower, which also is a very direct experiment that you can do. So it also um, has been playing not only a role in material science to know what is a good material to make paints, ice shuttles, and I don't know what, but it has of course been also something of extremely important in foundational ways. You remember perhaps that uh, in history of physics, one of the main motivations which was driving the transition from classical physics to quantum mechanics was indeed the problem of specific heats. It is more, it is older than black body radiation problem or photoelectric effect or what have you, the spectra of atoms. But it was there all the time. Already in 1860, I think you could see in this quote, and Maxwell was, was writing, you know, even though we have this molecular theory which works so well, the kinetic theory of gases, there is something which is not working, and that is the theory of the specific heat. This, this problem was not only the problem of Maxwell, but of other people like genes. Um, of Gibbs. I mean, Gibson, when he wrote his book on statistical mechanics in his introduction, he writes, look, I mean, here is a, this theory of uh, statistical mechanics. It works perfectly well, but excuse me, it is completely wrong concerning the heat capacities. And indeed, if we look at the first Solvay conference of 1911, that was central to understand how the theory of Planck, basically a radiation theory of a Planck, could be also used for, let's say, the molecular theory, theory of gases, but also for solids. Because in that time, if you remember, there was the Dunant Petit law, who was kind of governing what was the heat capacity of solids, but which completely failed at low temperature. And other things, even for water or something, or other simple things, gases, liquids, there was a failure to show the jumps in the heat capacity. But that would, of course, correspond to different levels of energy that were um, excited. Uh, in different energy ranges. It was an important problem. And why it was important? Well, heat capacities were teaching us about the structure of the matter. It was saying so. And around that discussion of what it was saying, how to understand that, basically the theory of solid state physics got into the quantum realm. I mean, the first models, Einstein model of solids, was about heat capacity. 
And it was like the start of solid state physics from heat capacity understanding. And even today, I mean, now I make quite a jump. If we are talking, I mean, let me put it in a good light. If we are talking about black holes or about gravitational degrees of freedom, one of the things we, first thing we want to understand is what's the entropy of a black hole, right? Or maybe what is the heat capacity of a black hole, which is probably the same in this sense. So that's the way to make progress. So if you ask what's the entropy of a tiger, that's not meant to be a silly question, but it's like a question to make progress, to try to ask the question and to make sense to, to what it means. Okay, um, so now let's get started, I guess, no? So the question is, first of all, can we define a physically well-motivated heat capacity for active systems? There are a couple of problems with it, no? What is temperature? What is uh, yeah, what is heat and all that? So, so we will have to figure that out, what we mean by that. But there will be um, a reward um, because we may be may able to answer a couple of questions, like, for example, I think it's a kind of cute question, like, how do thermal properties differ between an organized mixture of molecules and living matter? So it's not at all intuitively clear, at least not to me, suppose, I mean, forgive me the thought experiment, but we have some living matter. We can imagine, we will associate a heat capacity to it. Is it does it matter whether, whether the matter is alive or not? In other words, does biological functioning contribute to heat capacity? I mean, in the textbooks and in the usual tables that we see of heat capacities, it's a material constant, right? If you buy something, there is a tag on it. Heat capacity is so much. But you never ask, yeah, but what if it is alive? Does it change its heat capacity? So in other words, does the activity and the driving or different biological functioning, does it actually change the heat capacity? And what does that mean? In other words, is there more in life matter than purely thermodynamics of dead matter? And more broad is the question, can we actually, from measuring heat capacities of living, active, living matter, get information about the non-equilibrium features, just like we got information about uh, the energy spectrum of, let's say, ammoniac from heat capacity measurements. Right. These are the type of questions that should motivate us to be serious about that question. Okay, so let me start with the definition of heat capacity for such an active and driven system. So here are first some words, but there will be a drawing which makes it all clear. So let me read it together with you. Um, yeah, so, so the basic idea um, for a heat capacity. So first of all, let me, before I say anything, you could of course be too lazy. And by being too lazy, it would mean the following, that you say, well, okay, steady state, fine, but I can always look at what is the energy on average. It's a steady state, so energy is a macroscopic property, which is not changing in time. So I look at the average energy and I see how it depends on temperature. And that is what we learned in school to be the heat capacity of the system at fixed volume. So we just do that also in non equilibrium, except that the average will now be some whole, well, whether it is a time average or no song average, I don't care. But that would be a, a first definition of heat capacity. It would be, in fact, be the wrong definition of heat capacity. Of course, what is it? how can a definition be wrong? But in the sense that it is not in the right way, in the right precise way, takes into account what we mean by a heat capacity. And it starts not from energy, but from heat which is a flux of energy and not the energy as a state function itself. So how you should do it is the following. The main thing that already appeared in the work of Clausius, of course, is that you should consider transformations between non-equilibrium steady states. Just like in the old days, you consider transformations between equilibrium states, right? You go from one equilibrium condition to another equilibrium condition by slowly changing the volume or slowly doing some parameter change. So here we do the same thing, or at least we try to do the same thing. We take so-called, I call it quasi-static because I don't like the word adiabatic, but maybe you know it under the word adiabatic. I also don't use the word reversible. I'm just using quasi-static to emphasize it's very slow, very controlled, very slow change in a parameter of a non-equilibrium steady state. And you just 
connected to another non-equilibrium state. So if this parameter that is slowly changing is the temperature of an environment of that system, then we will have a good chance to define heat capacity. Right? So I remember, or I repeat, probably, that if we speak about temperature in that talk, think about the following. We have a non-equilibrium system, which is an open system. But think about the simple situation where we have this open system, which is driven by uh, work is being done, like non-conservative forces. For example, we have a resistor where there is an electric current going through, and it sits in a bath of water, and it always dissipates to that water. Right? It's due to heating. And the temperature has some water. If it is a big bath, of course, the change of temperature will not be much, but it also depends on its heat capacity. Right? That's what we are thinking about. So think about a non-equilibrium system sitting in a bath. Sometimes it's not so clear, like for a tiger, if we have the environment, what is it? It's the air, the bushes, I don't know what, but there's also a lot of water, of course, in the body of the tiger. So it's a bit more complicated, but the idea is we have a non-equilibrium action. It could also be that we have a um, boundary-driven system for stating boundary conditions, different chemical potentials, or even work that is done on the system. But think about the unique reservoir in which this work is dissipated, truly heating. And we will look at the excess of the heating because of the change in non-equilibrium situation. So here it is. So this here, oh, this is the time. So yes. So. We have time here, and I put here the, uh, the origin like the zero time. And we said that we have prepared, prepared the system before time zero in a specific non equilibrium steady state. You take your favorite non equilibrium steady state, and what is on the vertical axis is this power to so the dissipated heat flux, the heat flux to the environment. It's a certain, it's non zero, it's positive. That's the that's basically, it's not the entropy production rate, but it is the heat flux that I have in mind, the power which is dissipated. Right? So if I would multiply it with some more affinity, then it would get an entropy production. But here it's a heat flux. I just look at the heat flux. Now, at time zero, I'm not going to do the technicalities of a quasi static analysis, but I will do a shortcut. I mean that just imagine that at time zero, I change. The temperature a little bit. So here I had an environment temperature which is not T, and then after time zero I have a new temperature that I quench at T plus dt, but think of dt as very small, so that I simulate the quasi static situation. Right? So then after a long time, which um, for me is a short time, but for more for after relaxation, you get a new dissipation. So before that, your parameter was lambda, and now it's lambda plus delta lambda. So that's a new dissipated power you get in the end. Right? But there is a transition time, there's a relaxation, and there is, of course, a transition from that level to that level. In some simple way, we have this colored region here. That is proportional. That, that's what we call the excess heat. So excess heat is meant here to be the heat which is in addition to the so-called housekeeping heat. In all equilibrium systems, you always have this, you know, you keep the, the fire burning. There's always a jolly heating. But due to the relaxation, due to, just like in equilibrium systems, also when they are relaxed, there is entropy products. But so due to the entire, entirely due to the relaxation, this excess heat which is produced, which is in a way, to make it a bit more dramatic, um, the difference of two infinities. So there is the infinity just below that curve. That's the total heat because it's also if you integrate over time, I get heat. So the total heat is everything here. But you subtract the stationary heat flux. So that part here is then what remains, and that's the excess heat. Right? So it's like an infinity minus infinity thing. It's the excess heat proportional to the little change you made. This little change here in general is my delta lambda, where lambda is some parameter in my non-equilibrium system. 
And the, pro the constant of proportionality is a latent heat or a specific heat depending on uh, well, depends on what constraints you're putting, like always in equilibrium, you know, you have different heat capacities also depending on constraints. But to make it very simple, if we just think about the change in temperature, this excess heat is basically a measure of the heat capacity per temperature change. So that is intuitively how you should think about heat capacity for non-equilibrium systems. You can make it more complicated. I was referring to different types of environments or so, but that's the basic definition. So you have you look at the dissipation and you see what is the excess in heat flux you get, the excess in heat when um, you're changing the temperature. All right. Um, so you get the same picture with some words, but I don't think I need to add anything. So let me now go to let me now go to the simplest example, the very first example. So it's not a very sensational example, but it's already a non-trivial example actually, and it's um, actually an example which you could call a quantum switch, like a quantum dot or a two-level system, a qubit or something, except that. We do the following. So we have the two-level system. Think about the two-level system. So there is an energy change. Right? There's an energy between the two levels. And um, if we model this in the usual kind of Fermi golden rule type uh, way by speaking about transition rates, and we speak about the probability per unit time to go from one level to the other level, there is a way to do that, which you can derive from okay, all kinds of methods. but Basically, you would like to have, if you just have a two-level system and you know the energy and you know the temperature of the surroundings, then you have a condition of detailed balance. Right. So one thing that is then natural is to take a rate um, to go from one level to the other level, which is the exponential of minus beta, the energy change that you have to cross. And it's either epsilon or minus epsilon, right? This would be the transition rate for a two-level system. There may be other transition rates, like if you really go in the quantum regime, you would rather have uh, something which is bounded in temperature all the time, but let me not go into that. But that's the, that's the philosophy you would follow. You would follow like Fermi golden rule, detailed balance, and you would quickly end up with a description in a Markov jump process way, or in the Blavin way for me, uh, where you do these transition rates. But no, this is an equilibrium system because it's detailed balance, right? This time reversibility, the stationary distribution shows no currents at all. Okay? But now we make it non equilibrium, and we make it in non equilibrium in a way which you would visualize this in this picture. So instead of, we think of the two level systems as the minimum of this potential. And if I now do like the pedaling, I change what is up and down, right? And I do this change at the, at the switching rate alpha. Then, in fact, what I really do is I change the epsilon to minus epsilon all the time, right? This is the, the thing that I'm doing. So, in other words, what was before up is now down. Right? So, now I get the loop because I really have four states. I have four states and I have a loop possibly in it. Why do I have four states? Well, I have the two levels, but I can be in, in this regime or I can be in that regime. So, that's four states. And I get into a non equilibrium. Maybe the simplest non equilibrium mark of jump process. Is that okay? So now let us look at the time here. This is what I call a jump process. So this is the description of a mark of jump process. So I have two states. Okay, I said that we have four states, but here I will just plot the zero and the one. And the color is the code for being in that or that situation. I hope you can see the color is well, a bit yellowish brown and then it's a bit blue, right? So, for example, I start in the zero state and in that situation, and then because this alpha is just a random switch, so it switch, it's a rate for a random thing, it switches to the blue, and then in the blue it switches to its state, and then maybe back and back and what. I hope you understand what this drawing means, right? So I'm in time, and I have two times of change. I have the change in energy level, and I have also the change in the situation. So I'm doing work on the system. But the heat is this, this is the fire that comes out. It comes with the transitions in energy. It's when the state really, in the energy sense, changes, then I produce heat. So 
This is happening with a certain beta, which is the inverse temperature. And I can, if I have certain trajectory, just look at what was all the heat that is going on, right? I just add all of these things. And now I can think at what rate does it happen? Well, the rate is, of course, determined by these transition rates that we get in our Markov jump process. So from this kind of uh, playing around with the formulas, it's kind of clear, but maybe they'll be more specific in a moment, that I can look at, that I can see what is the heat flux. Basically, I have to multiply the transition rates, which was at minus epsilon, and the transition rates are chosen either to be with the, with the plus or with the minus, right? Okay, anyway, let me just go to the result here to show you already some aspects. So this is the heat capacity that I measured via computation. This is an exactly computable thing, of course. You can ask it in the course to students. Um, so that's the heat capacity versus the temperature. And I would like to tell you the full or, or remind you of three things. First of all, this heat capacity goes to zero at zero temperature. The heat capacity shows pronounced peaks. And thirdly, the heat capacity has an increase which is enormous compared to the equilibrium. So the blue one here, uh, which is alpha equals zero, which is really the equilibrium okay that shows this this is called the Schottky peak I don't know whether you have heard about it the so-called Schottky anomaly which is well known for low temperature quantum multi-level systems it remains true so you still see the Schottky peaks but it has been magnified enormously and, and being at low temperature the heat capacity still goes to zero these are from, this is just phenomenology for the moment, but already but you, you, said, yes. you are not changing the temperature, right? you are rather changing some other parameters. No. no. So, so what you are, what you are changing here? Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, I'm looking, so this is of course, uh, the process runs at a particular temperature, right? And now I imagine, I imagine that I change a little bit the temperature around that temperature. So I look at, for that temperature, what is the excess heat that I get? And that's then the heat capacity at that temperature. By the way, I could change other things as well, but here I'm looking at heat capacity only. Okay, but now another aspect enters because I have not specified or I have um, hidden something to you, and that is that I could imagine, you see, I have here this bump. See, I can add this one over tau as a kinetic barrier, which is time symmetric. It is the same for up and down. It's unchanged. So there is a delta here, which is like a kinetic barrier like in an Arrhenius factor. So if, you, if the delta is there and strong enough, you will get negative heat capacities. So if low temperature, you not only get the shock heat peaks, it all goes well back to zero, heat, to zero heat capacity, as in Davis or Planck law, but you also get regimes of negative heat capacity. By the way, in equilibrium, despite everything you have maybe heard, there are no negative heat capacities, at least not for short range systems. And if it is long range, like in gravity, it is because the microcanonical and the canonical ensemble are not equivalent. Anyway, here, this is a stable non equilibrium system showing negative heat capacities, which basically means that by giving heat, you lower the temperature, something like that. What was delta? The delta is the kinetic barrier. So um, more specifically, it's, is it physical? It's this thing here. So 1 over tau is e to the minus beta delta. And it's present always for every transition. So, so yeah, so it's to really get the, over this, this barrier here. Time scale. It's a time scale, yeah. It's a, but it depends on temperature, right? It gets hard to get and over. You the see when you change beta, change temperature, beta, yeah. alpha is not changed. No, it's not changed. I could change alpha as well. And I mean, it's again an exercise, then I go to another quantity, but here I'm changing beta in, this, in these figures. So you get short key peaks, you get pronounced magnification of heat capacity, you keep Nernst's law, and you have stable non equilibria with a kind of reversed thermal property that you get negative heat capacity. So that comes all for free already for the simplest system, which is this quantum switch. Okay, now um, 
here is a bit more formless and I do want, not want to specify too much, but you see, it's always like that in non-equilibrium. What are the principles by which we speak about heat? You know, I mean, is it just our imagination or is there some structure? You know, for this quantum switch, I was leading you, maybe misleading you to think that it's all very clear that you have heat associated to transition energy and it is correct. I mean, this is what you're doing. But how do you deal with the more general modeling in non-equilibrium where you just have transition rates? Where is the heat? How can you recognize it? Well, there is a principle which is not a, a dogmatic thing. It's not an axiom or something. It can also be understood in the so-called V coupling limit from starting from a more fundamental, let's say, Hamiltonian perspective that you can make sense of heat as being the logarithm of the forward and the backward transition rate, actually up to a beta, which is the inverse temperature. This is called local detail balance, but don't think of it as a mathematical condition. The point is that this object here is no longer depending on temperature and has the right to be called the heat, which is going in the transition when the system jumps from state x to state y. By the way, the x and the y states, what are they? Well, they can be very complicated. This is a bit an abstract thing. Oh, in the case of um, that we had before, they were just zero ones in the qubit. But if you have a molecule or a, a tiger, the x could be a much more complicated chemomechanical condition. And you live on a certain coarse grain state, and then you're looking in a Markov approximation the transition from one condition to another condition, basically on the mesoscopic level. These transition rates, when they are in a physically sense well defined, uh, with a reservoir which has an inverse temperature theta, gives rise to a Q, which will be the logarithm of this ratio. Sometimes this is called the fluctuation theorem, with just local detail. Um, no, so if we have this Q, we can make the dissipated polar. As I said, we, okay, now I added the subscripts lambda. The lambdas here, they are the subscripts, which are the parameters. They partially, they are temperature or other properties like alpha or other things. So now we take that heat, we multiply with the rate at which the X and the Y change over all the Y. That's the expected dissipated polar when you are in condition X. Now comes the most difficult formula, but it's a kind of intuitive thing, nevertheless. I'm not speaking about the quasi-static formalism, but I hope you can understand this formula here. So this is a time integral. So it's a time integral of power, so it will give rise to a heat. In fact, this object V, we will call it a quasi-potential. And what you do is, now you see, here I had a lambda, now I use a lambda prime, meaning it's a new lambda, like a new temperature. So I look at the stationary power, in the non-equilibrium steady state for lambda prime. And this is the subtraction from the station, the power at time t when you start it in x. This is maybe a bit complicated, but in words, it is the following. You draw a condition x from time zero, the situation you have at time zero. And then you look at every moment to the dissipated power, what you expect for a dissipated power at time t. And you always subtract the stationary power to integrate that over time, and that is the axis here. So that makes the formula for what I was showing in this kind of pictures here. This is what I'm doing. So in other words, you're here at time zero, you're drawing a state. So this at beginning point is not really always the same. So you have a beginning point, and you always subtract the stationary value in the new ensemble, so to speak. And the time integral of that, that gives rise to the to the um, excess heat. And this is what we call the quasi-potential. The same, I mean, it could have been the same rotation. The V? Uh, this V. Yeah, so this V is in fact, I call it, it's called the quasi-potential. It's in fact not exactly the excess heat, but that requires a bit more quasi-static analysis. But if you know this quasi-potential, you know the excess heat. Was that the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not exactly the XSC, but it gives rise to the XSC. But it is an intuitive notion. No? It's like always, it's like an infinity. This is infinite minus this. The integral of that is infinite minus infinite. But the integral of the difference is finite. 
this is called the quasi potential and is if you are in equilibrium so if you are in detailed balance let's see what this is uxy in equilibrium that's just the difference of energies and then the v is basically the energy minus the average energy so quasi potential is what replaces somehow the heat in general for equilibrium no, let us, um, okay, so let me not give all these formulas, but let us just add this one formula, which is important, and that's the, related to the question that we had just had. In fact, the excess heat is now the covariance between the quasi-potential and the pseudo-potential. So we have this V, which is this kind of excess quantity, and the logarithm of rho, rho is the stationary distribution, the non-equilibrium stationary distribution, the D measures how it depends on it, and if you take the covariance, that's the excess heat. I'm taking a very a notation which I do not like myself, but it's like the shortest I can get for the moment. So you see, in equilibrium, this is energy, this is energy, and you get the covariance of energy. The specific heat is given as a covariance of energy. But now you get a covariance or a correlation between the heat, quasi potential, and the Boltzmann large deviation functional, which is the pseudo potential. So before, as you remember, in equilibrium, Clausius and Boltzmann was equal. Now you get a, co a correlation between Clausius and Boltzmann, and that doesn't need to be positive anymore. So it can be that the spectra of the energy and the occupation of the energies is not in concordance with the heat, in the sense that you know the usual, um, the usual intuition that if you you're very cold, it's easy to accept heat, and if you're very hot, it's easy to give away heat. This is no longer true, or not necessarily true in non equilibrium, and therefore you get sometimes negative heat capacities because of the anti correlation between closures and Boltzmann. Okay, enough for these uh, formulas. I hope I know. Let me end with uh, uh, some conclusions and pictures. So, this is not quite a tiger. But it's close to what are called E. coli bacteria, in the sense that this is just a model of run and tumble particles. So this is one of the simplest systems of an active particle. So they are basically particles which are described here with the, this is no Langevin type description, but it doesn't matter. So these are particles which are um, sitting in a potential possibly. They are governed by white noise at a certain temperature, but they also have a kind of persistence in their velocity. They keep on going until they are told to flip their velocity. Okay, so this is a, a simulation now done by Brita Dolai, maybe some of you know Brita, um, for the heat capacity of this non equilibrium run and tumble particle. And you see again the heat capacity peak, the, the Schottky peak, which is quite different from equilibrium. And you also see if the, the persistence is very large, that if you go to high velocity, that is, that you can have negative heat capacities for reasons which we kind of understand. These are just examples. I'm not going to give all the details. So this is for a sinusoidal or potential. So this is an RTP in a periodic uh, environment, a periodic potential for the different. So in a way, by measuring the heat capacity, I can get the alpha. I can get the persistence or the flipping. So I can measure the, the healthiness of the bacteria. In the experiment, how do you... It's not an experiment, it's a simulation. Huh? Oh, yeah. So sinusoidal potential means you are actually using some nutrient profile? No, 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 no. This is purely computational and you just give it mathematically. But if you yeah, would do the experiment... Do you integrate into the run and tumble motion? Yeah, so, so the, the run and tumble motion is just characterized by this Langevin dynamics and we go with the mathematical model where we add the potential in the Langevin system. So we are not realizing it. We have not even thought about realizing it, unfortunately. But it's, a, it's of course, a very good question. So in this problem, the C, the insect C is negative. Yes. In the main plot, I don't see what I see. Yeah, because it's a different velocity. So it's only for high velocity that efficiently high propulsion speed that it gets negative. This is a V, which is 1, which is still positive. High activity. Well, there are two notions of activity. You know, there is the high propulsion speed and there is the, the alpha. Here you also need to have okay, it's a combination of the two which makes it negative. Well, how yes. does it change when you take the alpha? Do you take it with, with V? So Where fixing V? So this is. No, uh, no. Uh, I mean, uh, can you go back? The insert, right? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so this will not happen for when the alpha is too large. You have to have the low, this is 0.5. If I don't know exactly what is the alpha you need, but if the alpha is like T, you will need like a lot. I'm actually, it's, I do not know exactly. I, do, I mean, I do not know whether there's a limit actually, but if, but I, I think that on a certain alpha, you cannot go negative. So, uh, another question. So, uh, I mean, how do you define heat here? Because you would like to at some point invoke the energy conservation, but here, I mean, I don't see that. Yes, so that is what is called this in thing of this the method of local detail balance that you're using, right? So of course it comes with fantasy and imagination because you don't have in the in the dynamics it's just mathematics. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So so you have to understand if you write such an equation, you have to understand what is work and what is heat. Right. But you use the first law of thermodynamics, which is nothing to do with equilibrium or non-equilibrium, and you divide in the heat and into work. The work is done by the active forces, this is dp, and all the rest of the transition which is given by the energy change because of the state which is changing. So it's the usual thing. So what is heat? I do not have it, but in the paper I have it. Of course, we need it to compute this thing. Um, but by the way, heat is also measured for such systems. So if you really want to know the entropy of a tiger, what you should do then, uh, but I do not recommend it, is you should do this heat capacity of T and just integrate it, and then you get something, but I put a slash through it because it's not considered to be D entropy, it's just an entropy which is which I would call the heatish, heatish like entropy, it's basically defined by the entropy, it's not a whole state function. And by the way, the integral of these curves over temperature is not a constant logarithm two or something for the level for this quantum switch it would not need to be logarithm two. Oh, just a remark that uh, if, if you really want to speak about the quasi entropy you can but it doesn't lead quasi the heat capacity is much more interesting. Okay let me <clears throat> let me end with uh, well let me and let me show you something about now many body systems. So here I have a driven lattice gas and the driven lattice gas I'm considering is this one. So what is it? So it's just a one-dimensional ring, so it's a ring. So these are the sides, and at each side I have a two-level system. And this means I have a zero or a one, so one or no particle, and the zeta is just driving. So the particles are driven in what is called an asymmetric exclusion process. And at the same time, there is not only a temperature which is around in everything, but there's also a chemical potential, which basically tells you the transition between zero and one at each side. Right, so it's like a system of toppled hopping of ions in a ring driven, but at the same time these ions they can be getting into the trap or getting out of the trap by a kind of chemical ensemble chemical potential which is there. So this is um, a, a many body system and we can again here we can compute it by hand exactly and we get this kind of heat capacity. But the main thing I wanted to show you in the remaining minutes is not quite that, but it's the plots which you see, well, for example, the plots that you see here below. So what you see here is that the heat capacity, at least these lines, they are all for different types of, okay, so here is confusion. This delta is chemical potential now. It's not barrier, it's chemical potential. So for different chemical potential, it goes to zero but then there are some of them that go diverging. In fact, uh, so, um, uh, so in, as a function of the chemical, pot what is this, the chemical potential, okay, so the main, okay, let me not explain everything. The main thing is that there is a regime, maybe it's in the next slide, yeah, something like that. So you can see that if I look at the heat capacity as a function of chemical potential, I see peaks in the chemical potential, which in fact diverge at temperature to zero. So I get the zero temperature transition at a fixed value of the chemical potential. I get an infinity at a fixed value of chemical potential, but at zero temperature. So I always have that the heat capacity goes to zero as in a generalized Nernst law, perhaps you would expect, I don't know why you would expect, but it's true. But if the chemical potential is in a certain regime, it diverges. For example, here you can also see that it diverges. 
So that begs the question, what happens? I mean, th this is information, right? So what happens in the system? Why is there this divergence? Why is it not going to zero? So for that, we first have to understand why the heat capacity goes to zero. So this is a theorem that we have proven with Faza, Podabondelu, and Karl and Ochni, which is another key theorem for non-equilibrium jump processes, where we prove that if you have an arbitrary interacting or not finite state, discrete Markov jump process, which allows a local detail balance interpretation, uh, there are two conditions under which indeed the heat capacity goes to zero, as in the Planck version of the third flow, as zero temperature. And this, first of all, a condition which is the same as in equilibrium, which is basically related to non degeneracy of the thermal potential, basically crystallizes in a particular state, which is just an equilibrium. But in non equilibrium, there is a condition which is added. For example, this driven lattice gas that you just showed, if I turn off the driving, the heat capacity always goes to zero. This, no, this divergence only happens when there is driving. If the driving is zero, it never happens because it's always satisfying the Planck law. But when I turn on the driving, there is a static, there is a second condition that must be true, true and that is what we call a non uh, uh, it should be kind of well behaved behavior in the relaxation of this excess heat. You see, this excess heat was defined in a time integration. So now you're doing a relaxation fully, and it can change the temperature. What is this relaxation behavior? You're at low temperature, the relaxation can get slower and slower. In fact, that is just the entrance to the problem because that is not at all the main problem. Main problem is that in non-equilibrium, it can happen that, and here is a very simple example, I hope, it can happen that all the action is taking place in the loop for the dissipation. And here is all the heat being dissipated by the looping around. While in fact, you're starting from a state which has a barrier where you cannot go to the, where the action and the fun is. So there is a big delay here. The opposite can also happen. It can be that here, the stationary condition is concentrated and you're just trapped in the loop. So this kind of localization of the heat kind of can be a many body effect. It can be a chemical potential effect. It can be many things, but if such a localization makes a crucial delay in the relaxation of the heat flux, which gives rise to these deviations from the nervous towards zero temperature. Okay. And you cannot avoid such loops, even when you ensure well, the static Yes, yeah, so if it is non-equilibrium, you always have loops in the system. That is why it is different from equilibrium. It's really the loops that, you know, you could also say, why does it not happen in equilibrium? You can also be trapped and you could also have the, the energy relaxation. But it's really only because of the so-called dissipative structure that you have to reach. Okay, I think I have uh, more or less finished here. Just one more word, and that is that the way to measure these things, I believe, in the laboratory, as it is in computer simulation, is what is called AC calorimetry which is in fact not the way I have presented it. Um, so I have prevented, presented the theory via this quasi-potential, which is the kind of conceptually best way. But if you measure it, it's best to do it by modulating the temperature and to look at the out-of-phase component in the dissipated heat, which is also through an equilibrium. There's also a measurement like that. But this way of measuring heat capacity survives from equilibrium. And so the plot that Prita obtained, by the way, they're all done in this way of simulating AC calorimetry. Okay, I think that we have done so. There are quite some papers, you can find them in my home page, most of them, I think. But uh, what, is, what is sadly lacking is that we have, for the moment at least, no experimental systematic investigations of this kind of non-equilibrium calorie. Thank you very much. Questions? 
calculating his heat capacity is certainly interesting, but uh, in equilibrium, what makes it important, heat capacity, I mean, this is because, I mean, so this is a concept of reversibility. I mean, if you go in a loop, so integral dq dt x goes to zero. So that gives rise to the, actually the entropy, the state function. But it is not the, uh, so the picture. So that, I think, uh, well, I mean. So Thank you very much for that question. So this will be explained in the lectures next week. So I emphasize that I did not use the quasi-static transformation. It turns out that if you do the quasi-static transformation and not this naive t going to t plus dt, that you get the geometric quantity. So it's like a very phase that appears. And that one is just a parameter space. So it's in the thermodynamic phase space that you're making a contour, which is in fact reversible and geometric. So that's why this excess heat is the good notion to go to heat capacities because you recover exactly the same thing that you want in equilibrium. It's a geometric reversible path in, in, uh, in, in thermodynamic parameter space. So you get these properties. It's not because otherwise you could ask, does this heat capacity depend perhaps on the speed by which I'm changing the temperature or by what, how much I change? But that is almost true. So you can prove that it becomes geometric. Thermodynamically geometric, as some would say. Okay. And another spot on me. Uh, so you said that uh, for E. coli, uh, the bacterial experiment, yes. the experimental, they have measured that? No, no unfortunately, no. not this heat capacity, because this heat capacity is so new. That could be a oh, okay. but But what they did measure is indeed just the heat, which is uh, produced by actually a colony of real bacteria. And there it's completely different from what I did. Of what what I showed so rather, in the sense that it also multiplicates. No? We get more and more bacteria, and so they are looking, but also as a function of the ATP, I mean, of the food that is given, all this heat is changing. But there are, of course, many measurements today, I believe at least, of um, heat being produced by living or biological functioning. For example, um, if you are looking not at tigers, maybe, but at the human brain, we know of precise measurements about the heat which is being produced by speaking or by dreaming or by gambling and all that. So th there are measurements of such a heat. But excess heat is still tricky because, you know, it's, as I said, in principle, it's a difference of two infinities. But we believe that we have this method of AC calorimetry. You, do, you overcome that difficulty, and it should be measurable, but somebody has to do it. But probably, unfortunately, I'm not me. Can you define this thing when you don't have a uh, well-defined temperature? Okay, so well, it depends what you mean by a well-defined temperature. So first of all, this excess heat is defined somehow abstractly without speaking even about temperature, but just take your parameters that you have, could be volume, could be switching rate, could be some temperature, could be more than one temperature. So that is well-defined. So if you have multiple temperatures, in fact, the heat capacity becomes a matrix because you can change one reservoir and look at the heat change in another reservoir. So you get a matrix of heat capacities because you have multiple reservoirs. But so for that case, I mean, all of the reservoirs satisfy local dependence? All of them separately have local dependence because otherwise we don't know what this heat is. Yeah, that's what I mean. If you don't have local dependence. Yeah, if you don't have local detail balance, um, I do not know what is heat and I do not know what is entropy production. I mean, in the physical sense. Maybe I did a stupid question. Yes. This, uh, two level system which you described, when the levels are just interchanging, yes. yeah. how do you maintain quasi static nature there? Like oh. they slowly one decreases. No, 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 no. The quasi statics is not in the switching. It's quasi statics is the temperature change. So it can be any rate of switching, but while it is doing that, you slowly change it. You hear it, that I'm slowly changing the temperature, and then I, there will be heat produced, and that is that one that I suppose is being measured. So, yeah, so, so there are always two times. You know, there is the non equilibrium driving, could have a certain time scale, it could be periodic or it could be a switching rate. You know, there is non equilibrium action to make it steady, but then there is another thing which is slowly changing a parameter like temperature to get into the quasi static regime, even though there are all kinds of thermal uh, temporal processes happening which are not quasi static. Right. Thank you. I have a question, probably. Uh, so, uh, uh, the peak, uh, 
yes uh, short key peak the short key peak so why it shifts to lower temperature with increasing activity and what's the is there a physical way of thinking about the temperature at which the peak is appearing? yeah so that's of course a very good question for the moment the only thing we have is that we can locate it in exactly so of the moment how it depends on temperature but we have no general understanding of that um, of course we have formulas but we do not have an intuition for that you Happy it's still there because it at least shows already the multi level nature still of that we have. So, in that sense, it's what the anomaly <coughs> But the fact that it is magnified and shifted to lower temperature, there is no, for, at least for me, I do not have such an intuition. So, in the RTP model, uh, you have uh, used. So in case of this non endumbral particles, so are they uh, the system of single particle or the many particles? Here, for the one I showed you, this was a single particle, but you know, I called it a gas, uh, yeah, yeah. meaning that they are independent particles. So I think of it as an ensemble of independent particles. But of course, the analysis you can do for a single particle and pretend it's just an ensemble of many particles. Oh, so U is not the interaction potential? Well, it is not, it is just the background potential, like the crystal is the two loops. But if I really want to make some propaganda here, I would say you can think of this U as the kind of taking into account in a mean field way all the other particles. But let me not say that. Then how do you, I mean, change the non-equilibrium condition here? I mean, oh, the, the, there is not, a, I do not change the non-equilibrium condition. I have this, this propulsion speed, which makes it non-equilibrium. You know, the switching of the velocities and the temperature is in the environment. This is the white noise that I'm giving. So I'm, it's not purely RTP, it's, all, it's thermal RTP. Right? So I'm adding this white noise at a certain temperature and that gives rise to an environment and that's the temperature of that environment that I'm slowly changing. So I take the bacteria, I give them food, but I put them in an environment at a certain temperature and I see that they are they are heating up the system around them. I try to measure that. And now I change the temperature and I see what is the, how much do they heat now. And that difference in that excess, that's called the heat capacity. And that hopefully will tell us something about the activity of the bacteria. It's far away, no? I'm mean, talking here about these studies are all pioneers. It's far away. I hope it will be possible, but it's one of the ways that you could have a diagnostic test of the health of the activity of your system. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. And uh, in the high activity region, uh, you uh, said something about the negative uh, yes. heat capacity. Yes. So you comment, uh, in what well, okay, so the, the matter, again, the mathematical origin is I, I abbreviate by saying that it comes because of an anti-correlation, a negative correlation between closures and the Boltzmann entropy, which is no longer the same. Okay, but that are just the words of saying. What is happening is this kind of, I'm not sure whether I'm saying it correctly, but it is something like deposit, depot models, depot, not deposit, depot models, where you're, um, instead of, you know, in, in this non-equilibrium system, um, instead you can give heat to the environment, right, just by the non-equilibrium somehow, and it can be that you give even more heat when the environment temperature gets higher. I mean, you know, the point is just that just in non-equilibrium, you can change the occupation of the levels, no? And usually in equilibrium, you have the lower energy levels which are occupied, and then if you make the temperature higher, you get the higher levels which get occupied also. But in non-equilibrium, it can be that you occupy for high temperature, the lower levels, and for low temperature, the higher, you get population inversion. But this, this population inversion, which is a general thing. Now, if you ask me about RTP, the details of that, well, I can, I can, I can just can do the mathematics or simulation and formulate the general idea, but it's not sufficiently rich in my mind to understand it in detail. Thanks. Thanks. Also, also talking about the good that you can make a refrigerator out of this. Well, I mean, if you have a non-equilibrium, it must first of all be plugged in, right? So refrigerators have a... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 People have, but you don't need heat capacities for that. You have already this kind of non-equilibrium engines. 
Yes. Any other questions? Question is. Is there any question from the online audience? Is there? No, there is no question in the chat. No, in the chat. So Christian is around until next week, and he is in office 308. So yes, it will be very welcome. And uh, he's also giving two lectures next week. Yeah, I hope that I can explain some details. But if you're interested, be very welcome and bring your questions. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.